Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. What really happens when we die? What does afterlife really mean? Who the heck is the ferryman? Hello, and welcome to the 934th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno, coming to you from WON, AM, and FM Radio here in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, on the Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live, on YouTube, and via TuneIn.com. I'm Ben, and those immortal questions came from my co-host, partner in Paranormal Adventures, and dad, Paul. And today we bring you a returning guest with a wider perspective. Uh, before we introduce our wonderful guest, though, uh, we must uh, mention the fact that this is the 19th anniversary of the the disastrous and tragic Station Nightclub fire mm. here in uh, Rhode Island. All of us in Rhode Island and eastern Connecticut were touched by that. We all knew someone who was either uh, killed in the fire, a hundred people uh, lost their lives, and uh, we just commemorate uh, them today. There is a lovely memorial now in that spot, and may their memory be eternal. Indeed. <clears throat> Anthony Peake is a British author and researcher who deals with borderline areas of human consciousness. One of the world's most original thinkers, he is a graduate of the University of Warwick in England and did postgraduate work at the London School of Economics and the University of Westminster. Since his first book, Is There Life After Death, was published in 2006, Anthony has gone on to develop his own ideas, together with exploring the latest areas of research in his field. His tenth and latest book, published in 2019, is The Hidden Universe, an Investigation into Non-Human Intelligences. The basis of our discussion today is Anthony's forthcoming book to be released in July, Cheating the Ferryman, The Revolutionary Science of Life After Death, sequel to his first book mentioned above. His website, Anthony Peake, Peake with an E, Dot com. So, Anthony Peake, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. It's wonderful to be with you guys. Oh, it's wonderful to have you back. We, it's, I feel like it's been a while, um, but it's... it's, well, it's almost two years. Yeah, I know, but you've been sorely missed, and we're, we have to make up for lost time now, I suppose. And, and I guess the first thing we're going to do it, for making up for lost time is to talk about time in some way, shape, or form. So let's begin you know, a few thousand years ago. Um, for anyone who might be a stranger to Greek mythology, who is the ferryman referred to in this book title? Right, okay, just going back then, in ancient, in the ancient, when somebody died in ancient Greece, what would happen is that there would be placed over the eyes uh, two coins called obolai, or, or ordinarily sometimes placed one coin underneath the tongue. And the idea for this was that when the person found themselves in the land of the dead, they would find themselves by the the, the edges of a great river. Um, Technically, it's the river Acheron, but for for, for general purposes, it's the river Styx. And what they believed was that out of the mists would come Karen the boatman. And the the, the need for the the coins would be to, to, to to give the ferryman the coins to pay so they could cross into the land of the dead. Now, in my argument, I believe that we cheat the ferryman. We don't pay him his obolai. Now, it's quite important here as a very quick aside to explain some other interesting ideas that the ancient Greeks believed in. And one of them was that after you'd crossed over, you were given a choice of either staying in the land of the dead or drinking the waters of the Lethe, waters of the River Leith, which was a tributary of the Styx. And this was the river of forgetting. And according to Plato, what would happen is you would drink the waters of the Lethe and you would forget all your past life, who you'd been in your past life, and you'd be taken back across the River Styx, back to live your life again. The idea being that all your past life memories had been wiped clean and effectively you lived your life again. Now, again, this was an idea that was taken forward by the Stoics and various other um, groups in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome and carried through into Gnosticism as well. And this is the concept of the eternal return or the eternal recurrence. So by cheating the ferryman, that's what I'm talking about. I argue that due to 
uh, series uh, and interesting areas of the, how the brain functions at the point of death uh, when we're talking about neurochemistry and uh, the neurotransmitters in the brain that are present at the point of death that something extraordinary takes place and we're misinterpreting the information um, and that there's a far more interesting alternative to life after death and effectively, it is living your life over and over again in the final nanoseconds before you actually die. Well, you know, when I was studying Greek uh, in the seminary, I was a, a strange question. I asked, you know, where on earth did uh, the ferryman spend all that money? Did he knock off and go to Tesco's after work or something? But uh, to return to the serious business of the bright side of death, uh, <clears throat> we were wondering, um, so that is. Could you translate the, the, those ancient Greek beliefs into your, what's going to be in the book? I don't know, you, you might not want to give too much away, but um, how do you yeah, translate sure. that into modern thinking? Well, one of the things that, um, when I, I wrote the first book way back, effectively I wrote it in 2000, 2001. And although I had, I made some interesting angles and some interesting themes that I, I worked on in that book. I always felt that I needed more time to develop the ideas. And anybody who's read all my books know that over the, the last period of the last 15 years, 16 years, in all my books, I'm fascinated by certain topics. I'm fascinated by the near death experience. I'm fascinated by out of body experiences. I'm fascinated by the subjective perception of time. I'm fascinated by deja vu as a phenomenon, and I'm also fascinated by the implications of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Uh, I'm also fascinated by the implications of um, cosmology, particularly some of the recent discoveries regarding black holes, regarding the fact that um, the universe seems to be at its very base information. In other words, the basis of what we consider to be three-dimensional reality is in fact two-dimensional and it's holographic. Um, and pulling all these things together, um, I believe I can come up with a fairly convincing scientifically based hypothesis that suggests that death or death when we see somebody else die is not the end for that personality, for that person. And again, my most important points in my writing is I start and finish with the science. I take the science and then I apply that science to people's experiences so effectively if somebody for instance i'm fascinated when somebody has a near-death experience nobody doubts that near-death experiences are real but the question is what is taking place during a near-death experience is it some form of super sophisticated hallucination and if indeed it is a super sophisticated hallucination that explains nothing because nobody actually knows what hallucinations are and indeed one could reasonably argue from a knowledge of um uh, perception studies that that actually our perception of reality and on everything that we perceive is in fact a brain created hallucination. The problem is we don't know what hallucinations are. Um, and anybody that says that they do is applying what I call label theory. It's the idea that if we don't know what something is, we give it a nice label, preferably with a Latin frame, either in Latin or in Greek to to impress people. But in point of fact, we really don't know what hallucinations are. And in this particular case, I'd suggest a, a very careful reading of um, Oliver Sacks's book, Hallucinations. Um, because in my book, I'm fascinated by things such as Charles Bonnet syndrome. I'm fascinated by the supposed time illusion of deja vu. I'm fascinated by precognition. And the thing is, with my cheating the ferryman hypothesis is it can explain most extraordinary human experiences i can accommodate my hypothesis can explain totally why we're precognitive and why under certain circumstances people can see the future and i don't need to go into any crazed ideas all i need to do is to apply known science to actually do that all right now you mentioned the science of course and the science is actually <clears throat> rather broad <clears throat> because we have been mentioned time uh, so putting uh, science and time together, we end up with things like uh, the special theory of relativity and other, other scientific points of view that indicate that science uh, that that the time does not really exist, at least not sequentially. It seems to be uh, simultaneous. That's a point of view that is accepted by many scientists today. 
What does that do to the idea of recurring lives? What does it do to the idea of dying at all? Uh, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of a quote from Einstein when he was referring to uh, writing to the wife of a friend who had, had uh, translated, as we say. And uh, he said, uh, those of us who believe in physics, uh, it, so many words have a very different view of death because of, uh, of time. So what say you? Well, what the circumstances is that we die within time. And so one of the major points is that we die one moment we're alive and one moment we're dead, one moment we're no longer there. Now, the question is, and I, I discuss this extensively in my book, The Labyrinth of Time, yeah. as to exactly what we're talking about when we talk about time. Time is one of those things, as you will know um, in your, your studies, as St. Augustine said, when I don't think about time, I understand it, and I fully understand it. But mm -hmm. as soon as I start to think about it, exactly what time is it becomes very very confusing for example you know what do we mean by the present moment for example one could argue that we don't really exist in that our past it's just memories which no longer exist and the future are anticipations which no which do not exist yet so we exist in that nexus point between stuff stuff that has already happened and therefore doesn't exist and things that are about to happen, which also don't exist. So we have that kind of nexus point we call now or the present moment. But how vanishingly small is the present moment? Scientist David Finkelstein was a famous physicist who came up with his concept of the chronon and the idea that there is that time itself is quantized as matter is quantized. In other words, that every every piece of time is not related to any other piece of time. They're both unique pieces. Now, on top of that, we consider that time is linear, that time flows in some way. But a moment's reflection here starts to cause problems as well. For one simple point, if time flows, what is it flowing against? Now, again, I'm talking here about Marcus Aurelius came up with a famous quotation about time is a river. Mm. But when you look at a river, the reason you know a river is flowing is because you can see the banks. You have a reference point by which you can gauge the speed of the flow of the river. But time, there is no gauge point for time. There is no ba river bank for time to tell us how time is speeding or slowing up. And this is where the problem starts to arise, because time perception is personal. We know that time can expand depending upon your own psychological circumstances. If you're in a state of stress, time expands. We know this, you know, you hear the story time and time again. You know, somebody falls off a horse, he's in a car crash, time expands. In my new book, I have a whole section on time expansions when people are in accidents and people falling off cliffs and things. Now, again, in around, I think, around about the 1880s, there was a guy called Albert Heim, who was um, a Swiss mountain climber. And he'd had a series of experiences where he'd fallen off mountains and he'd survived. But on each occasion, not only did time dilate for him phenomenally, but he also had something that is reported in near-death experiences called the panoramic life review. The idea my life flashed before my eyes. Now, again, as an interesting aside, Albert Heim, as I'm, I think I'm right in saying, was Einstein's physics teacher when he was at school. Mm. So there's an interesting link there. with, And I just wonder whether a lot of the work of, of Albert Heim and his writings influenced Einstein in his interest in time. Now, we all know this report in near-death experiences where they say, my life flashed before my eyes. People report that they see their whole life in a, 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 a millisecond. But remember that this is a near-death experience. Imagine the scenario of a real death experience. What is then happening? Does does that life review flash or does it actually does time slow down to such an extent to accommodate the fact that you can live your whole life again in that final second? Because, of course, we know that time is subjective. So the final second of your life could actually be 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 years, a lifetime. As far as you are concerned, you continue on in this smaller bit of time, but somebody watching you in linear time sees you die because you're living in a whole different time space. 
Now, again, I would say before people are turning around and saying that Anthony Peake is talking complete nonsense here, what I would suggest you do is look up the writings. And again, in my new book, I have a whole section on this. Um, the writings of some of the, the, the newer physicists. There's a guy called Max Tegmark, who I think I think he's at Princeton. I think he may be at MIT. And he has come up with a model he calls the quantum suicide experiment. And he uses quantum physics and an application of Schrodinger's cat to suggest that from our own personal point of view, death is impossible. OK, now, what is fascinating about this? And again, I talk about this in the new book is why Max Tegmark came up with this idea. Now, he wrote it about 1998, 1999. But you read his latest book on, on the universe as a mathematical structure. And one in the book, he describes when he was a young man cycling through Stockholm uh, on his way to school. He's on his bicycle and he's, he's cycling along with his bicycle and he comes to a junction in a road. And at that point, his mind makes a decision that he's going to just cross the junction because there's never any traffic early in the, at the time in that morning. For some reason, he didn't. He found himself slamming the brakes on. It wasn't him. It was something inside him that slammed the brakes on as a juggernaut came crashing past. So Max Tegmott would have died at that moment. And it made him think, well, maybe in some other variation of the universe, applying ever its many worlds interpretation, for example, or the more sophisticated versions we've got now called the many minds interpretation. In one reality, he did die. But in the reality he survived in, he didn't. Now, I'd say to everybody listening to this program, don't you find it intriguing that in your life, you always survive? You have survived through your life listening to me saying these words now. Now, don't you find that strange? Other people you know die, but you survive. And I'd argue this is because you are living in what the ancient Greeks would, what um, I think it was Charles, Charles Saunders Pierce called the phaneron. The idea that we all have our own internally generated reality and we exist within that internal generated reality and we interface with other people as our individual collapsed wave functions intermingle. Now, again, within quantum mechanics, we know that effectively reality and everything around us is in a wave function. It is a statistical wave function. Every single subatomic particle that makes up the universe is has its own wave function. And that wave function is a statistical wave function. But at the act of measurement, and some many scientists would argue at the act of observation of a sentient being, that potential reality, that statistical chance of a subatomic particle being in one place or another, is collapsed into a point particle and all the point particles around you are being collapsed to accommodate your interpretation of them. Now, that would mean evidentially that if you were not there to interpret them, those those wave functions would not collapse. It's unique to you and it's unique to me. And we all have our own unique worldview. Now, again, the very last paper that Max that um, um, Stephen Hawking wrote was a paper he wrote with a CERN guy called uh, Thomas Hertog. And they wrote some, they came up with something called a top down hypothesis of quantum physics. And this is and get this. This is Stephen Hawking. The idea is that every potentiality is out there. All it needs is its wave function to be collapsed. So encoded within the universe itself is the outcome of every decision that can ever be made by anybody. It's out there. It's already encoded. Now, if we then take that and extrapolate from that the developing knowledge now that the universe is a vast hologram. And again, in the new book, I do the science of this. People who know me in my books, I do not just take these ideas. I don't say I'm channeling it from the planet Tharg. <laughs> I turn around and I give you the science and I say, given this scientific information, what conclusions as a rational human being are you likely to make about these? OK, now the idea is this is holographic in nature. It's to do with black holes. It's to do with something called Hawking radiation. And it's to do with the second law of thermodynamics. It's also to do with the fact that it's at its basis. There's more and more information that the universe is digital. That everything is made of information. It's created out of bits, literally on off. And everything we have is digitally encoded. Not only this, 
But the, 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 the modern physicists even argue we know where this digital encoding is. It's on the very inside edge of the expanding universe. This is very intriguing. And the argument is that um, it's all to do with things called Planck squares. It's the smallest area you can possibly have. And each Planck square on the edge of the universe can encode one bit of information. Now, they did a calculation a few years ago. I don't know how on earth they did this. But they calculated that if the universe has been expanding, what, for 13.7 billion years, it's been expanding in that size, what would the size be from the point particle from the Big Bang, taking into account the inflationary period right at the start of the expansion of the universe, as to how many Planck squares there would be at the edge of the universe? They then calculated how much digital information, how many bits of information would be needed to encode the information contained within the universe. They came to exactly the same figure, exactly the same number. Now, that relationship is extraordinary. That suggests that we are digital beings. We are existing in a two dimensional reality that's expanded and is being projected inwards holographically. Now, this suddenly makes the world of very, the universe a much more interesting place. And the relationship between consciousness and the observer and the external reality can now explain the collapse of the wave function, how it is that my mind can inwardly generate the imagery that fulfills the external universe that's around us. It's very, very intriguing, and it's scientifically valid. Indeed. Mm. Uh, can we take a break a little early? Uh, anything is possible, Father. Okay, <laughs> because I want to get into some listener questions, and uh, the show was about six hours too short. Uh, for, we'll have to have Anthony back to continue this Anyway, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WOON 1240 AM, 99.5 FM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. And we shall be right back with Anthony Peake. The night is alive. Join us and take a walk on the weird side when you tune in to The Kingdom of Nye, hosted by Heather Wade the finest in late night talk listen live free weeknights starting at 9 p.m pacific time at the kingdom of nigh.com talkstreamlive.com and the paranormal radio app wanna take a ride local and live at 99.5 fm and welcome back to WON radio am and fm in new england and we are talking with anthony peak uh, the uh, amazing British researcher and consciousness thinker from uh old friend of ours, certainly. And uh, we are talking today about uh, pretty much death, Cheating the Ferryman, his next book. And uh, let's continue the discussion with a couple of um, questions, questions from listeners. Yes. Take it away, Ben. Indeed. So uh, the first question here is uh, we have our, our, our famous guest, our famous guest co-host and, and long-time listener and, and friend, Peter Shelley, uh, who always writes amazing questions. And so the first question he has is, um, uh, Anthony, you have speculated that the reported life review associated with near-death experiences becomes a total life repeat in quote-unquote actual death. Uh, assuming this could be correct, what do you speculate happens at the completion of the total life repeat and beyond? Excellent question. Excellent question. And thanks for asking this one. I, I personally on this, I, I, we're moving from um, science to philosophy here. Also teleology, you know, the reason why things are. Is there a purpose in things? Now, of course, I can't say I can't do the science of this, but I can do what I would consider to be the logic and what makes sense to me. And what sen- makes sense to me is that effectively... An analogy, I would say that it's Groundhog Life. You know, in the movie Groundhog Day, Connors lives the same day over and over again, but each day he changes his changes what he does. Um, I've interviewed on my own podcast Danny Rubin, who was the guy that set, who wrote the first script of that movie, and Danny told me that he he expected um, Connors to have lived. I think it was somewhere in the region of 44,000 lives, 44,000 days. Okay. And the idea is, and my hypothesis, I suggest, as I say, but this is more philosophy than anything else, is that we live our lives over and over again, and every time we live them slightly differently. And we live them slightly differently because we are evolving. And it's a matter of 
you know that some people say, you know, that reincarnation, you're reincarnated. Okay, you're reincarnated as somebody else. You're reincarnated as somebody else and you don't remember anything about your previous life, which means that you can't put right any of the errors or the things you did wrong in your last life. Now, I believe that if you live your, your, you live your own life over and over again, not as an eternal return, not as the same life, every life is different. And every life is different for a very important reason. Because I suggest that we all have a game player. If we're living in a simulation of our lives that contains the outcomes of every decision we can make, we have a game player who's guiding us through our lives. And I call that being the daemon. And the daemon is the immortal you. The daemon is the you that has lived all your lives before. And this daemon tries to guide you as best it can, depending upon how open the communication channels are neurologically between you and the daemon. Um, some daemons can communicate through dreams, some of them through uh, feelings and sensations. I would argue, for instance, Max Tegmark's daemon was very effective in saving his life that year, many, many years ago in Stockholm, when it remembered at that point that he was killed last time, and it managed to stop him being killed this time. So you can imagine in a, 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 a computer game, you know, Max Tegmark on screen and his game players playing the game, and Max Tegmott's cycling down the streets, and suddenly the game player goes, God, I remember last time I played this game. My on-screen person was killed. I've got to stop him. So he allows him to continue till the next challenge and the next danger. Now, what I believe actually is about happening here is that over thousands of lives, maybe, we end up living the perfect life, just like Connors does at the end of Groundhog Day. Do you remember he's running round Punks to Tawny? He, yes. he knows from his research that there's a young lad going to fall out of a tree and break his leg. He makes, he's try he does good for doing good's sake. Now, just rolling back here, do you remember Connors at the start realizes he has prior knowledge that other people don't have? So he tries to use it for selfish reasons. He tries to bed the girl. He tries to win money. Then he realizes that's not what he, what he wants to do. So he then gets into education. He wants to teach himself things. He learns how to play the piano, he teaches himself foreign languages. But then he realizes he can do good for doing good's sake. He's evolving. He's becoming an avatar. He's becoming a bodhisattva. He's becoming somebody who is doing good for doing good's sake. And I believe this is the final outcome of cheating the ferryman, that you live your life over and over again and you live the perfect life. And then there's some kind of mechanism that allows you to move on. I don't know what that mechanism is. But remember, it all happens. All these multiple lives all happen in orthogonal time. That is a time that runs at right angles to ordinary time. And the, all these lives can be accommodated there. And then you die. And then you move on to whatever that is, wherever that place is. It could be your own religious belief places. Who knows? I don't know. But I think that makes sense to me. It means that I can go back and I can try and right the wrongs I've done, the people I have hurt, the wrong decisions I made, or even taking the opportunities to do the other things that you have always thought, you know, I should have taken that opportunity but didn't. I wonder what happened if I'd have asked that girl out and married her. These kind of things. Now, and I have to say this is quite important, that remember, it's not just your life that is influenced but the life of your ancestors, your, your ancestors, all the people behind you have all been making decisions, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. And each one of those decisions will change you and will change the world you exist in. Because, of course, there'll be millions of other people making decisions. You could end up in a universe where a cure for cancer is found. So in which case you might be in a universe that you die of cancer in this one, but you don't die in that one. Do you see what I mean? How just sure. elaborate this can become? See all the time. Well, let's. Uh, I have a billion questions. Ben, you've been writing furiously. Oh yeah, my notes are very schizophrenic. They're all all over the place. <laughs> okay, well here's one that's not. A uh, question from uh, Lauren in Connecticut. Yes, if you would please. Sure. And uh, Lauren writes, uh, "What does Anthony think about God? Obviously, he quote unquote isn't what organized religion says." Uh, uh, but something else. Uh, so what thoughts does Anthony have about who slash what is the source of the universe? Who created this and who is keeping it going? Right. OK, again, quite an intriguing point. Um, I consider myself to be 
spiritual probably in terms of my thinking um and and open to ideas and thoughts I, I don't you know i'm not an atheist i don't rapidly just dismiss there's too much depth to this to be that mm-hmm. now i i'm coming to the, the new model i'm developing at the moment which is probably the ideas for a new book at the moment and the idea is that i'm quite enticed by the idea of um pandeism hmm. and the idea that effectively everything is what we would call god for want of a better term and the idea of pandeism is is literally everything is just God. And we are singular emanations of that God. Uh, Again, I'm reminded here of a famous monologue by Bill Hicks, the American comedian, where he turned around and said, breaking news, young young man on acid discovers that everything we perceive, matter is just energy at a slower speed, and we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. Now, of course, if you go into most of the great religious traditions throughout history, You will discover there is this concept that you have to discover the God within. You have to discover the the shard of of the God that's beyond us, that's inside of ourselves. You know, the Gnostics idea that there is a shard of the Pleroma that exists within inside ourselves where we're trapped within this simulation or Kenoma. Now, the idea is that... Oh, Oh, did we freeze up here? We uh, might have, might have lost, lost, lost connection. Wow. Oh. Don't, don't you just love living in the 21st century? Yeah, these open Oh, hey, look at that. We have him back. Okay. Am I back? And I'm sorry, we interrupted your monologue with uh, technical difficulties. Uh, so please proceed. Okay, it always happens. Yeah. It always yeah. happens. You're on a roll, and then and then technology just decides yeah. to hey, stop it's working. It's the archons. Acting <laughs> yeah, it's the archons. Um, but going back, so the idea is that we are all a single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And the idea is that, say for argument's sake, that there is a single consciousness, which is the universe, which is God. And God has all eternity to, to just do whatever God does. What would you do? You'd get bored. So what would you do? You'd create your own soap opera. You'd create your own universe. And then what you would do, you'd, you'd place in that universe sentient beings. And then what you would do, you would suffer from what Plato called amnesis, which is forgetting what you are and place yourself within your own soap opera and exist within your own soap opera. So every single consciousness that we experience are all emanations of the same collective unconscious. Okay, and it's forgotten what it is. And again, Philip K. Dick, an um, an American science fiction writer that I wrote a biography of a few years ago, Mm. argued this as well. In one of his books, books, The Divine Invasions, he has a young man called Manny, who is God, who's forgotten he's God. And again, this God forgetting he's God is something that is in a lot of theologies. Now, again, if we look into uh, Ayadvata Vedanta, in Vedanta there is the concept that there is one single consciousness, which is Brahman, and Brahman is asleep. Now, these are all ideas But it does suggest to me that probably my hypothesis of the daemon. Remember I said before that's the daemon, which is the you, the the universal you that has lived your life before. In my new book, I'm going to suggest that we within the simulation are what I call Eidolons. We are the in-game sprites that exist for one game, one life, and then we die. But our daemons live all our lives and they have iterative memory. But then I argue above the daemon is something I call the uber daemon. And the uber daemon is the, comp- the equivalent of Jung's collective unconscious. It is, the, it is the thing that carries through human history. It's the, part, it's, an, it's the universal collective of human consciousness, or maybe all consciousness. And then above that, I have the concept I call the godemon, which is what we would loosely call God the intelligence behind it all, the digital thing that runs everything. And that makes sense to me. Now, it doesn't, it, you know, there's no science there. I've, I do some of the basic science. But if you extrapolate from that, that starts to make sense to me. And it, it, it resonates with me. It resonates with me, the idea that I can live my life again and put things right as best I can. But it resonates with me, the idea that the world, the universe is not just a pointless exercise in nihilism it's something that has a purpose and the purpose is allowing all of us collectively to evolve and to 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 find the god within ourselves 
to move ourselves forward. So this, this is why a lot of people like my books, because I'm not dismissive of any belief system. You know, I very much believe in the, the idea of the perennial philosophy that um, Aldous Huxley suggested, that there is a truth in all belief systems. And I believe that truth, and it's going to sound incredibly vain here, it's not meant to be. People who know me know that I'm not like that. I believe cheating the ferryman, and I believe the developing models I've got and, and speculations I have can accommodate that and can make sense. And when people come across my ideas, when they really think about them deeply, and I mean really seriously deeply, they usually come to me and they go, my God, I didn't realize that's what you were saying. It's extraordinary. You have accommodated everything about the human condition. Um, and it works for me. That's all I can say. It works for me. Mm. There's a, I want to want to take a, a half step back because there's, you brought up something. I don't even know if you intended to do this. Um, you probably did. You're a very smart man. Um, there's a problem with postmodernism. And the problem with postmodernism is eventually you hit a wall. And the wall is called nihilism. And I find it really interesting that you've managed to find a way around the wall, sort of. Mm. And it's 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 a it's a really it's a big one. Um, and I guess I guess there's there's a few questions that come to mind. And the first one I, I kind of have is, what is the perfect life? Mm. Well, I suppose again, if you go back to um, uh, Vedanta and various other belief systems. The perfect life is living a life that is as far as you can be sinless, whatever we know what the term sin is. But living a life that is completely altruistic, that is completely wanting to help other people. Don't you ever sometimes feel that the most rewarding thing you can ever feel is when you do good for some, you do good, you help somebody. You help a beggar, you give a beggar some food or something. That inner feeling and inner warmth you get is indefinable. But it's it's priceless because you've done it because you've been selfless. Now, this, again, is interesting because we're talking about nihilism here, but we're talking about very much an application of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, as mm. he said in The Gay Science. You know, the idea, imagine a demon, a demon came to you one night and told you that you would live the same life over and over again. Of course, I argue they're different lives. But what Nietzsche was, the subtlety of what Nietzsche was saying here was that if you knew that you were going to live this same life over and over again in the identical way that you've lived it this life, you would make sure that every decision in your life was made knowing that fact and knowing that you were going to relive that moment over and over again, in which case that would release you. Because many people get Nietzsche wrong in this. You know, the idea is it's almost a release. As he says in The Gay Science, if somebody told me that, I would say, thank you. You have given me, you've, you've saved me. Now, I argue that you don't live the same life over and over again. You live different lives. But nevertheless, it's something we're driven towards it. You know, we're, we're driven towards want. Well, I'd say that many of us are driven towards wanting to do good because that's what we want to do. You know, there are some people and within my overall hypothesis, I will argue that um, people who are psychopaths and people like that, their daemons are just as psychopathic as they are. So the daemon isn't necessarily a good being. It is a reflection of you. So if you in, are inherently negative, your daemon is going to be inherently negative. For instance, I've argued in one of my previous books that Hitler's daemon saved Hitler's life in the Stauffenberg plot. In 1944, when Klaus von Stauffenberg and his associates tried to kill Hitler with the bomb in the meeting, I don't know if you know, but his uh, uh, Hitler's foot kicked the bomb accidentally behind a pillar. Now, I believe that I, I was Hitler's I thought someone daemon. else did that. I didn't realize that Hitler I, I'm did I'm sure. Himself. I might be wrong. I mean, people, I can stand corrected, but my reading was it was Hitler himself. But even so, the argument goes that, 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 that he then survived long enough for much more people to, to die and everything else as well. So my argument is a simple one, that your daemon will guide you in order for your e, its Edelon to survive, whatever its Edelon is planning to do. And this is where I have a concept which I call the cacodemon. And the cacodemon is the evil side. It's the kind of the shadow within Jungian psychoanalysis. You know, it's the shadow. It's the dark side of us. 
And myself and an associate at the moment worth, uh, are thinking about writing a book on this and expanding this out to the, the Godemon, the, the Kakodemon, uh, and the, probably the Kalos Demon, which probably is the good demon. Again, the idea that, you know, we have these kind of dividing dichotomies within our lives. You know, it's again black and white. It's the whole idea of, um, you know, sort of the whole dynamic of contrasts within life. You know, so it's dichotomous in many, many ways. One of the odd things that I've noticed in human spirituality, at least in the West, and pretty much everywhere today, is uh, something that uh, you might want to comment upon uh, because you've kind of gone, you know, you've touched the fringes of it, is the notion that once we are born, uh, we haven't existed before that, which may or may not be correct, once we're born, we are us, and we remain us after we die, and we remain us forever. But in the singular, not the... Yeah, right. well, yeah, ourselves, yeah, mm. without the notion of the shared consciousness or non-locality. Right. Uh, I, I've always found that rather odd. Uh, it's an expression of the island theory, as we call it, and you're familiar with our writings. Uh, what say you, how does that, that sort of fit into the worldview you've presented today? Well, it's it's very interesting, isn't it? What makes us us, and what yes, makes I mean, is. going back, for instance, to the um, the idea that we've not lived before. You know, the argument is, you know, we come from nowhere. As 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 in the new book, I have a whole section on on Martin Heidegger, oh, yeah. and Heidegger's <laughs> idea of being thrust in. You mm-hmm. know, that we are thrown in. Is it design? I think, or something like that. The idea that we we don't ask to be born. We just are. We just we are here and we have to deal with it. You know, again, you know, in this request, I'm reminded of being the the movie uh, with uh, Peter Sellers. You know, the idea that we're just thrust in. Mm. But there is growing evidence that we there are evidence that even an, an embryo seems to carry memories with it. For example, we know that if you you look at the embryo, it's dreaming. An embryo dreams. Now, what can an embryo be possibly dreaming about? Now, modern scientists have argued that when they've discovered this, it's it's the it's the it's genetic. It's the the brain working out how it's going to work when it's born. It's testing out certain ideas. But the question has to be there has to be memories and structures and perceptions to fill those dreams. Hmm. Now, we argue there is an argue now called epigenetics and the idea that somehow we carry a racial memory with us. We carry through our DNA the memories. Now, again, in my previous book, I was fascinated by DNA because DNA is informational. The DNA codons can be used to to keep to actually hold information. So clearly we have something here going back to the information field, back to the idea that everything is information. Everything is data. Everything is digital. And the the DNA codes this. Now, could this explain how there are certain things we know instinctively when we are young? You know, that there's been experiments done. For instance, I found it a fascinating experiment whereby you take a day old chick, bird chick, and you and you and you put a cardboard cutout of a swan over it. It doesn't react. If you put a cardboard cutout of a, a hawk, it cowers and tries to hide. Now, where is that memory coming from? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not in the brain of the day old chick. It's not possible. But mm. we know that is a fact. Now, so it suggests that we have had prior existence. And I'd argue the prior existence exists in orthogonal time. And the prior existence exists within the cheating and the ferryman hypothesis. Mm. And that's where that prior knowledge is coming from. I'd also argue that, again... And we haven't had time to discuss this, but I'm also fascinated by the role of neurotransmitters in the brain and how it seems that our reality modulator is is a substance called dimethyltryptamine. And the idea that endogenous, internally generated dimethyltryptamine is what creates the reality around us. We are living in effectively a hallucinatory state created almost through the chemicals in our brain, which in which in itself are digital, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, that that's huh. I always provide so much food for thought. Um, I I I do. 
I'm trying to figure out how to, how to phrase this with, with what I just heard. Um, so I guess, you know, going, going back to the sort of analogy of ancient, ancient Greek mythology, right? Um, mythology not meaning myths, but sort of mythology as in stories we participate in. And there's a really interesting, um, Greek is a really interesting language because they have multiple words that mean the same thing but different. And one of those is uh, the the two words they had for time. You had Kronos and Kairos. Kronos being chronological time, Kairos being sort of time outside of time or cosmic time, if you will. Would you say that we would participate in both these times at once or is it sort of because everything's kind of filtered, distilled through our experience. Everything we know is unfortunately distilled through our experience, right? You know, we have an objective reality that we're observing and we're subject to it, and all of our experiences are distilled in this, but there's a sort of a third portion of it that kind of informs mm. our experience, I would say. Would you say that we're living in multiple different times at once, or perhaps there's just all that's perceived and that's it? Ben, that's an excellent question. One of the things that um, in the book I deal with and I've read in, I've written about in the past is um, Hermann Minkowski, who was mm-hmm. Einstein's teacher. And Minkowski came up with a concept called block time. And block time effectively is that there is a time outside of time. And I give an example here of what you may understand as being block time in a movie. Um, there is the example of the Tesseract sequence in the movie Interstellar, mm. where Christopher Nolan wants to put across how time is not how we perceive it, that it's a singularity. Um, and there's the sequence where uh, Coop, who's the main character, is trying to communicate with his own daughter. And if you don't know if you recall, but there's a section, there's a bookcase, mm. and he, outside of time, pushes a book out of the bookcase into his daughter's reality. Mm. Now, we perceive his daughter in the way that, going back, we have the critical fusion facility of the eye, which I think is 24 images per second. Mm. That's arbitrary. There's no reason why it couldn't be a year per image. Mm. It's, you know, it's, in other words, it's very much humanistic in its viewpoint, and it's looking in the world through our sensory apparatus. Mm-hmm. But there's no logical reason as to why we could not perceive time in a much longer period. So imagine you were looking at a person from the viewpoint of a creature whose critical fusion facility was 70 years. Now, going back to the concept of block time, the idea is that if you are in the fifth dimension, looking down at the fourth dimension, the four dimensions, the three dimensions of space and the one of time, and you're in the fifth dimension outside of that, a human being will not be just a body it will be a long snake-like object snaking through time. Mm. And each moment is just a cut through of that particular moment. And it's like almost like those flick figures you used to do as kids when you draw things and you could flick through them and they'd move. Or like a cartoon does. Because a cartoon, and indeed any film, is a series of still images that are flicking through at 24 images per second, which gives us the illusion of movement. But the, but the actual film is a long, thin strip. Now, I'd argue this is how reality works. Time is not as it seems because time is an illusion. Now, again, if somebody's interested in the real time and the maths of this, there is a fascinating English writer called Julian. Um, oh, God, my brain's gone dead. Um, I'm Julian Barber. Julian Barber. OK. And Julian Barber wrote many years of a book, a book called The End of Time. And he uses physics and maths to prove that time is an illusion. As Einstein himself said, time is an illusion, but it's a very, very persistent one. Mm -hmm. And this is what we've got to break out of, is this trap of time. Once we start to be thinking timelessly, and we start to realize that time, time, time goes slower on your feet than your head, because your feet are closer to the earth and therefore is influenced by the mass of the earth. So in which case, your time, your feet are actually older than your head or the other way around whatever it is Mm. so from the viewpoint of a creature on the sun remember again in interstellar they end up on this planet where the 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 gravitational fall is so strong that they're down on the planet's surface for years but Mm. the people out going round in the satellite it's only a few days Mm. and this is this is how it works you know time is not what it seems and you die in time 
So this is I I've always felt this is the clue. This is the clue. It's time. Anthony, we uh, need about six more hours to even get into this further, but please tell us about your website, where people can get the, your other books, and uh, when the new one's coming out. Yeah, okay. No, you can get all my books. You can just go into your local bookshop. You can order my books on your local bookshop. Some of them even have them on the shelves. Um, you can get my books on Amazon. You can get them on all of the electronic e-distributors. Um, most of my books, all my books are in Kindle. Um a number of my books are in um, are in Audible, um, most of which are me reading my own books. And also the new book, when it comes out, will also be out in Kindle and it will be out in Audible and it will be out in all the formats you can possibly think of. Um, that will be released actually now on the 1st of June oh, cool. uh, this year. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, no, it was originally the 1st of July, but they've moved it forward now. My publishers all moved it back, isn't it? Um, so... You can get hold of my books. My website is anthonypeak.com. I'm also phenomenally active, probably far too active on Facebook um, <laughs> and on Instagram. I spend so much time on there, but when I have an idea, I'll upload it onto there, uh, and I'll be uploading links on this. And also, I'm also very, very active. Um, uh, I have my own YouTube channel now, mm -hmm. uh, which is proving extremely popular. Um, and if you're really interested... Um, in the next few weeks, I've done a sit with a, a, a group of um, filmmakers um, and video makers. We've done a, a nine, a nine three quarters of an hour programs on each of my books. There's one program on each of my books, and I have talking heads, I have scientists, I have researchers that are all involved in this as well that we interview as part and parcel of this. And this will be released over the next few weeks. Outstanding. So there's a lot of material out there. Just Google me. Um, but the books, you, you can see my talks and everything else as well, but it's the books that give you the information. It's the books that give you the references back to the source material, to the academic papers. I don't expect you to take my word for this. I want you to make up your own minds. So in which case, read my books and then read the references and decide for yourself if I make my case or I don't. And if you don't believe I make my case, let's engage. That's what I want. I want engagement. I don't I don't want people to just accept my ideas. Mm. If I've made an error in my quantum physics or in my maths or in my geology or in my neurochemistry, tell me. I'm a big boy. I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> One could not ask for more. Anthony, you're a dear friend and a major theological figure. We'll have you back very, very soon. Okay, thanks very much, guys. It's been, as always, wonderful to talk to you. Always a pleasure. Very good. Okay, we look forward to the New England Parafest in Kittery, Maine, which runs from April 10th to the 26th, 2022. We'll provide more information as these dates approach. Indeed. And you can visit our show website, that's BehindTheParanormal.com, where you can find uh, over uh, 1,000 hours of our regular shows, special broadcasts since 2008 from CBS Radio, Achieve Radio, and here on WOON, AM, and FM, uh, including those that have been restored in the archives at BehindTheParanormal.com. You can also hear us on many of these uh, major podcast platforms um, that includes iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, and you can check us out on there. And we also have a show app, a very simple one, but you can download it at BehindTheParanormal.com, and uh, new shows as they are posted will appear magically. Mm. And browse our books along with those of our other guest co-hosts at uh, our show website, again, BehindTheParanormal.com where you can find out more about the show, our many cases over the years, public appearances, and how to book us. And our show website has a uh, charity page as well with links to several good causes we've adopted uh, over the years, including uh, Hope for Hilldale Cemetery in Haverhill, Massachusetts, uh, USA Cares, Canadian Veterans Advocacy, uh, Help for Haiti's Orphans, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, the Sisterhood of Ground Zero, and most recently, um, the Western Connecticut Sorry, the Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund. Let's not start any rumors here. No, 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 no. Yeah, not, right. not the plan. <laughs> exactly. So uh, what's uh, skulking in the cave for next week, then? Indeed, and we're going to make platonic analogies on uh, February 27th. <laughs> uh, we bring you an open line show to tackle your questions on all sorts of paranormal subjects, and our guest co-host will be Valerie LaFasso. And uh, just a little bit of a spoiler here, uh, coming up in May, 
Shane Searway, the great one and only Shane Searway, will be back on our open line shows. Ah, from his hiatus. From his hiatus, and uh, we'll, um, I can't think of the exact date, it's the 15th, but he'll be back uh, very soon, and we look forward to that. Yes, it's been been too long, too long. So we leave you today with an apt quote from British science fiction fantasy author Tom Holt, speaker one. Pile up that gold around my head, I must take it with me to pay the ferryman, speaker two. I thought it was just a coin in the eyes or something. Speaker one, inflation. (laughs) I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. And we shall see you next time on Behind the Paranormal. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.